Hey, so good day everyone. So for today's meeting, we will be discussing viewing the microbial world. Now, this one is quite interesting because uh, we will be discussing the world of the unseen. Because majority of these micro, most of these microorganisms are not able, or you cannot actually see them with your naked eye. So that's the reason why um, it's very important that we know what are the proper measurements or how what are the types of microscope that we should be using um, in order for us to visualize these organisms so that's why um, aside from the introduction uh, we will be dis we will have we will be discussing the metric system system to express the size of microbes and alongside with that we will be discussing the different kinds of microscope um, the simple microscopes, the compound microscopes, by the way, uh, we will be focusing more on the compound microscopes and then the electron microscopes and then the atomic force microscopes. Okay, so let us now discuss uh, what are the met what are the units of measurement that we will be using. So we will actually be using the metric system to express the size of the microbes. Okay, so the size of the microbes are being are being uh are being described in metrics, okay, which is actually the exact opposite of the English um uh the English system of measurement now. So we will be using the metric system. Okay, so the basic unit of length in the metric system is the meter. Okay, so one meter. So usually that's how we describe it, no? And one meter is actually equivalent to 39.4 inches. So, however, because these microorganisms are so small, we cannot, ex we cannot describe them in meter. We cannot express them in meters. So most of the time, we will be expressing them in micrometer. Okay, so this is the sign for micrometer. This is not letter U. Um, this is this is um, pronounced as mu. Okay, so a micrometer. So take note, huh? a micrometer is one million of a meter. So if we're going to if we're going to express it, it is expressed this way, no? One micrometer. Okay, so one micrometer is equivalent to one million okay, of a meter. Okay, so a typical spherical, spherical bacteria, so yung sinabi kanina, coxite or cocos, is approximately one micron in diameter. One micrometer in diameter. So let's say, for example, just to give you an idea, RBC. RBC or the red blood cell is equivalent to seven micrometer. Then if this is the RBC, which is seven, and then cocos is about one micrometer. Okay? A typical rod shaped bacterium, so we call it bacillus, is approximately one micron. One micrometer wide and three micrometer long. So one micrometer wide and three micrometer long. Okay, so that's a bacillus. By the way, for you not to get confused, huh? when you say cocos, this is singular. But when you say cocci, this is plural. So the same way, if we say bacillus, this is singular. And when we say bacilli, this is the plural form. Okay? So, let's discuss this um, unit of measurement. Okay? So, one meter, one meter. So, this is how we usually measure meter. If you go to if you go to a dry goods or dry market and then you buy a cloth, so approximately that's how they will be measuring 
one meter. Okay. So one meter is equivalent to 100 centimeter. Okay. So, which means that in every 100 centimeter, so one meter, one meter could be equivalent to 100 centimeter. Okay? But one meter, when you say millimeter, it means that you divide one meter, 1,000 equal parts. So, that's one over 1,000. And a while ago, we talked about micrometer. So one meter is when you one micrometer is that when you divide one meter into one million equal parts. And when you say um, nanometer, okay, nano means nine. So for you not to get confused. One meter, okay, just add, just add nine zeros. And that is equivalent to one, uh, that's how you divide one meter. Okay, so therefore, one meter is equivalent to one meter that is divided into one billion equal parts. Okay, so that's how we usually describe it. Okay, now. For microorganism, it is very rare that we use this. We don't usually use this unit of measurement because they are so small. So most of the time, we are using this unit of measurement. Meaning to say, one micrometer, in order for you to convert it to nanometer, it means that you divide one micrometer into 1,000 equal parts. Okay, so that's how we describe one nanometer. So, therefore, when I say um, the size of RBC, the size of RBC is 7 microns, then it is also equivalent to 700 nanometer. Okay, so that's how we describe uh, RBC. So what's the size of RBC? It's 7 micrometer or it is 700 nanometer. Okay. So that's the unit of measurement. Okay. That we, that we will be using when describing microorganism. Now again, this will give you an idea. So a while ago, I told you that this is one cocos. Okay. So one cocos is equivalent to 100 micrometer or a uh, one micrometer or it is also equivalent to 100 nanometer okay so meaning to say um this is bacteria no cocos is an example of bacteria then these are viruses except for this one um it is uh, bacteria din to. So, herpes virus, pox virus, polio virus, and influenza virus, they are even smaller. They are even smaller than bacteria. In fact, the biggest bacteria is the pox virus. I'm uh, sorry, the, the biggest virus is the pox virus. And this one is even smaller than a single focus. So, approximately uh, ito yung measurement ng pox virus, no? It's more than at least 0.2 microns. But it is even smaller than Staphylococcus. So, that's the reason why we call viruses as filterable agents. Because of their size, um, they are small, and they're even, they're even, they're able to pass through bacteriologic filter. So because of their size, because of their size, they're small and they're able to pass through a bacteriologic filter. Okay. 
So, the size of viruses are expressed in terms of nanometer because they are so small. So, a, non, a, non, a nanometer, nanometer is equivalent to one billionth of a meter. So, this is what I've described to you a while ago. It is equivalent to one billionth of a meter. So, in order for you not to get confused, so do not forget that there are nine zeros here. Okay? Most of the viruses that cause human disease range from in size between 10 to 30 nanometer. So, one exception is the Ebola virus. So, Ebola virus is the causative agent of viral hemorrhagic fever, and it can be as long as 1,000 nanometer or about 1 micron. Okay? So, when using a microscope, the size of microorganisms are being measured in ocular micrometer. So, how do you know um, an ocular micrometer? So, usually the stage of the microscope, um, the one that you can see here, um, I hope it's clear. Yeah. So, can actually see here the ocular micrometer. Okay, so this is the one that we're using whenever we are measuring the microorganisms. Okay, so moving forward, let's talk about the microscope. So the human eye a telescope and a pair of binoculars and magnifying glass and microscopes, these are actually different kinds of optical instruments. So our human eye is an optical organ. A telescope, binoculars that we're using, magnifying glass that we're using, the microscope, these are types of optical instruments. So an optical, a microscope, therefore, is an optical instrument that used to observe tiny objects, okay? Objects so small that they cannot be seen with the unaided human eye. So that's the reason why in order for us to see them under the microscope, uh, in order for us to see them and visualize the shape, the morphology, the structure, then we will be needing, we will be needing a microscope. Now, each optical instrument has a limit as to what can be seen using the instrument, okay? The limit is referred to as the resolving power or resolution of the instrument. So what do you mean by resolving power or resolution of the instrument? Meaning to say, when you say resolution, when you say resolution, it means that a good microscope with a good um, resolution means that it is able, able to distinguish one part of the cell from another. Meaning to say, if a microscope has good resolution, it's just like the camera of your phone. Things that you will be seeing under the microscope is not pixelated yeah, because of a very high resolution. Okay? So the resolving power of an aided eye, if you will we will not be using, if you will not be using microscope, is only about 0.2 millimeter. 0.2 millimeter. And it also depends on your age. So that's the reason why. Personally speaking, whenever I'm looking at the lab, at, at the label of the medicine bottle, I cannot see anymore those very small font because the resolution of our naked eye is 0.2 millimeter. Below 0.2 millimeter, we cannot distinguish that anymore. So that's the reason why we need to use a microscope. Okay, so who invented the microscope? Actually, it was Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. So, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek invented the first type of microscope. And I think this was the first 
microscope that was invented by Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. So it's just a simple kind of microscope. Okay? So um, a simple microscope is one that contains only one magnifying lens. There's only one magnifying lens. Therefore, a um, magnifying glass could be considered as a simple microscope. So if you are using a magnifying glass, images appear to be 3 to 20 times larger than the actual object size. So Leeuwenhoek's simple microscope had a maximum magnifying power of about 300 times only. Okay, so this particular microscope has a magnification of 300 times, meaning to say it can enlarge the object up to 300 times. However, during that time, it was enough, okay, to see tiny microorganisms. And because of the, because of the discovery of Anthony van Leeuwen Hoek, okay, this now led to the science of microbiology. However, during that time, they are not aware of the term microorganisms. So instead of calling it as microorganisms, um, they're calling it animal cues, animal cues, okay? So as years pass by, microscopes have actually improved. Now, we are now using a compound microscope, okay? So a compound microscope contains more than one magnifying lens. So it contains more than one magnifying lens. And visible light is the source of illumination. So a compound microscope is also referred as a compound light microscope. So the one that I have here is an example of electric. Okay. So this is an electric, electric um, light microscope, compound light microscope, and and why do I say electric? Because um, we have a plug, uh, but right now I have I haven't plugged it in so that it will not light up. So usually, if you have plugged it in and there's a button here, then the light uh, will be illuminated from here, and it's an LED light. So it's now a modern microscope. So so this particular compound light microscope can magnify objects up to 1,000 times, especially if we will be using this particular objective. Okay, so this objective is the oil immersion objective. So if we will be using the oil immersion objective, the one that you can see here, okay, it can magnify objects up to 1,000 times. And to top it off, the resolving power, the resolving power of a compound light microscope is approximately 0.2 microns. Remember, the resolving power of our eyes is just 0.2 millimeter. Just 0.2 millimeter. But the compound microscope has a resolving power of 0.2 micron. That's about 1,000 times better than resolving power of the unaided human eye. Okay, so this particular tool, the one that I've shown you, um, that tool is indeed very helpful. So that tool is indeed very helpful in order for us to see microorganisms. Okay, so it is the wavelength of visible light that limits the sight of the object that can be seen. What do you mean by wavelength? Um, just to give you an idea, wavelength is actually like this, no? When light travel, when whenever light travels, light travels in a wave-like pattern. Uh, contrary to many belief, light doesn't travel in a straight path, but rather it travels in a straight like pattern and the distance between each wave this particular distance is called wavelength and we have different wavelength we have visible spectrum the one that can we see 
we can see different colors in our surrounding because these particular colors are within the visible spectrum. However, there are even invisible lights that cannot be seen by our naked eye, particularly the ultraviolet light and the infrared. Because these two kind of light, these two kind of light are in invisible spectrum. Okay? So the one that can be seen by our naked eye are those within the visible um, spectrum or visible light. So approximately 0.45 microns. Okay, and that limits the size of objects that can be seen. So objects cannot be seen if they are very small, smaller than half of the wavelength of the visible light. Meaning to say, um, if it's too small, then we cannot use compound microscope. Okay, because it says here, objects cannot be seen if they're smaller than half of the wavelength of the visible light. What's the wavelength of the visible light? 0.45. Meaning to say, below, below 0.23 microns, that's kind of hard for us to see already. Therefore, we cannot use anymore the compound microscope. Instead, we can use a much higher a, a, a microscope with a much higher magnification and resolving power, such as the electron microscope. Okay, so today's microscope contains two magnifying lens systems. No? So what are these? What are these magnifying lens system? So we have the ocular. So these guys, the ocular, and the other one would be the objectives. So these are the different kinds of objectives, okay? So the objective length of four, usually we call it the scanner. Objective length of 10, usually we call it the low power objective. Times 40, so this is the scanner. I hope, uh, yeah, so... This is the scanner. Now I will be shifting. Huh? Um, this is the low power objective. This is now the low power objective. And then this is now the high power objective. And then this is the oil immersion objective. Okay. So these are the different kinds of objectives. No? So, times 10 is the low power objectives. Times 40 is the high power objectives. And then times 100 is the oil immersion objectives. So, these are the different types of objective lens. So, this is the first set of lens. And then this is the second set of lens. Hence, we have the two lens system. And since it is a two lens system, that is the reason why we call it a compound microscope. It's a compound microscope because of the presence of a two lens system. Okay. So, what are the different types? Uh, what are the different parts of the microscope? So, a modern compound light microscope, sorry, a, a modern compound light microscope is divided into three parts. Okay, the first part is the mechanical part. And then the second part is the illuminating part. And then the third part is the magnifying parts. So what are the mechanical parts? Okay, so this is your base. The base. So the base 
holds the entire microscope all together. In fact, the proper way of carrying the base is that you hold your one hand into the arm like this and the other one through the base. Okay, so this is the proper way of carrying the microscope. Okay, and then we have uh, the stage. This is the stage. Okay, this is where we place the specimen here in the stage, on the stage. Okay, and then of course, uh, we also have the um, binocular body. Um, before we call, we used to call it pillar, but since it is, uh, I don't know, the, the pillar is supposed to be here, somewhere here, but now because of the a more modern type of microscope, binocular body is here, and the binocular body holds the two binoculars. We have two sets of binoculars, no? So this is now the binocular bodies, okay? So that is considered as, that is considered also as the part of the microscope. And then we have the revolving nose piece. So the reason why we call it revolving nose piece, nose piece because it can be used to shift from one objective to another. That's the revolving nose piece. Medyo mabigat, parang lumalaki tuloy yung biceps ko rito. And then, um, aside from that, we have the adjustment knobs. So there are two adjustment knobs. We have the coarse adjustment knobs and the fine adjustment knobs. Um, this is for the general uh, magnification. So usually, when you are in LPO, you are using the coarse adjustment knob. But for a for a finer resolution, usually if you are in HPO, you are using the fine adjustment knob. So again, the coarse adjustment knob is bigger than the fine adjustment knob. I hope you can see. So the dark color here is the coarse adjustment knob, and then the much lighter color, which is gray, is the fine adjustment knob. And then we have the on and off switch in order for us to illuminate. I think, yes, this one, the on and off switch. Okay, so, yon. so these are the different kinds of the different parts, the mechanical parts of the microscope. Now, how about the illuminating part? Okay. The illuminating part include the, um, first of all, the light source. Okay, this is the light source. So that's part of the illuminating part. And then, and then below this, in, in this particular, in this particular, this particular structure, you can see a condenser. So the condenser is located here. So what's the function of the condenser? The condenser will concentrate the light. So that's the function of the condenser. And to regulate the light, regulate the entry of light, because you do not want the light to be too bright or too dark, then you have to use an iris diaphragm. And there's an arm. So this is the arm of the iris diaphragm. I hope you can see it. Okay, so that's the iris diaphragm. And some microscope would have rheostat control, but in our model, we don't have a rheostat control. Okay, so these are the illuminating parts of the microscope. And for the magnifying parts of the microscope, we have the ocular and then the objective. Okay, so we have the ocular. So the magnifying part includes the ocular. And then we also have the objectives. So 
we have four types of objectives. Scanner, LPO, HPO, and OYO. Okay? So, how do we compute for the total magnification? We compute the total magnification by multiplying the magnifying power of the ocular lens. So, remember... This particular ocular lens has a magnifying power of 10 times. It is written here. So it says here 10 times. So ocular has 10 times magnifying power. Okay. So the ocular is multiplied by the magnifying power of the objective lens. The scanner, the scanner is has four times magnifying lens, then LPO or low power objective is 10 times, high power objective is 40 times, while oil immersion objective is 100 times. So all we have to do is to multiply um, the objective magnifying power with that of ocular so that you'll be able to get the total magnification. So which means Scanner would have a total magnification of 40 times. Low power objective would have a total magnification of 100 times. High power objective uh, will have a magnifying power of 400 times, while oil immersion objective it has a magnifying power of 1,000 times. Now, it is also noteworthy to take note that oil immersion objective would have to use a cedarwood oil. Okay, so cedarwood oil is needed whenever you are using oil immersion objective, hence it's called oil immersion objective. Okay, so oil immersion objectives uh, means that you have to immerse that with oil and what's the purpose of immersing, immersing it with oil so that light will travel, light will travel in straight path and it will not go astray because the oil will help concentrate it directly to the objective lens okay so that's the purpose of oil immersion objective okay so whenever uh whenever you take photos okay in through the lens system of the compound microscope so we call it the photo micrographs so yes, that's possible, especially some microscopes are directly connected to a computer system so that uh, so there's a camera that will automatically, um, uh, you can automatically take pictures of things that you, that you are seeing under the microscope. Okay, so that's about the compound microscope. Okay. Um, because objects are observed against a bright uh, background, okay, it's called the bright field. So most of the time, we are using the bright field, okay, or the bright field microscope. However, do you know that the condenser is like a filter? So this is a condenser, and it's like a filter. And you can actually change your condenser, okay? So sometimes people would be using a dark field condenser. So what is a dark field condenser? When you say dark field condenser, illuminated objects are seen against a dark background. Okay, so only, so you have a dark background and things that you are observing is the one that has, that is illuminated. So unlike in bright field, it is a bright background, while in dark field, it's the other way around illuminated objects are observed against a dark background so it's a dark field microscope and it is sometimes useful for observing spirochetes or spirilla so ano ba yung mga examples ng spirochetes spirochetes such as treponema pallidum so other types of compound microscopes include the face contrast microscope so usually uh, we are using this to visualize um, highly refractive objects. So usually being used for highly refractive objects such as platelets. 
And then we can also use fluorescence microscope. Um, this one uses UV light. So again, UV light is under the invisible spectrum. And this one is kind of uh, nice because you'll be using a fluorescent dye to stain to stain the microorganisms and you'll be able to see uh, microorganisms that can glow in the dark. Okay, so if you are using a fluorescent microscope. So this is an example of a dark field microscope, um, Treponema pallidum. So you see, it's a spirochete. So the background is dark. The background is dark while the microorganism is illuminated. On the other hand, this is a fluorescent microscope. So you are using a UV light and a fluorescent dye so that you'll be able to see organisms that can glow in the dark. Okay, so that's how we observe naman um, Treponema pallidum using a fluorescent microscope. Okay, so um, phase contrast microscope, like what I'm uh, showing you, uh, I, I discussed with you a while ago, is used to observe unstained living microorganisms. Okay, so organisms are more easily seen because the light refracted by living cells is different from the light refracted by the surrounding mediums. So that's the reason why I told you a while ago it is actually being used for highly refractive bodies such as platelets. Fluorescence microscope, as what I've told you, has a built-in ultraviolet light source. Meaning to say, when the UV light strikes certain dyes and pigments, such as fluorescent dyes, these substances can emit a longer wavelength light, causing them to glow against a dark background, as one that you can see here in the illustration. So this is an example of a fluorescent microscope. Okay, uh, a photomicrograph taken using a fluorescent microscope. Okay, so let's talk about this time an electron microscope. So electron microscope enable us to see extremely small microbes such as rabies and smallpox viruses. So these are extremely small microorganisms. So living organisms cannot be observed using an electron microscope. So because the process procedure will kill the organism. Why? Because whenever you are using an electron microscope, there is an electron beam okay, used as the source of illumination. Meaning to say, meaning to say, you will not just use light, but you will be using an electron beam beam. And magnets are being used to focus the beam. You will not be using a condenser, but you will be using a magnet. Okay, so electron microscopes have a much higher resolving power than compound light microscope. And unlike compound light microscope, which I could carry from one room to another, that's kind of impossible for the electron microscope because here you will be needing a a room dedicated for that particular instrument. Now, take note that there are two types of electron microscopes. We have the TEM, that is the transmission electron microscope, and the SEM, or the scanning electron microscope. Okay. So the transmission, so this is how the TEM look like, no? Imagine, no? You cannot carry this from one room to another. The TEM is much bigger than humans. Okay. So this microscope uses an electron gun to fire a beam of electrons through an extremely thin specimen, a specimen that is less than one micrometer thickness. So an image of the specimen is produced on a phosphor-coated screen. Okay. Magnification is approximately 1,000 times greater than the compound light microscope and the resolving power is approximately 0.2 nanometer. Imagine, our eyes have a resolving power of 0.2 millimeter. The compound microscope 
has a resolving power of 0.2 micrometer, whereas the transmission electron microscope has a resolving power of 0.2 nanometer. Can you just imagine no, how small a 0.2 nanometer is? Meaning to say, because of the transmission electron microscope, we can now photograph viruses, okay, such as an influenza virus, the one that you can see here. Take note, you cannot photograph an influenza virus using this compound light microscope. Okay, this one is not powerful enough to visualize this influenza virus in an electron micrograph. However, if you will be using a transmission electron microscope, then you'll be able to see even influenza viruses or any even any small virus. Okay. So aside from the TEM, we now have a scanning electron microscope. Okay. So in scanning electron microscope, electrons are bounced off the surface of a specimen and the image appears on a monitor. So this used to observe the outer surface of specimen. So the resolving power is about 100 times less than that of the transmission electron microscope. So scanning electron microscope is less powerful than the TEM. Okay, so transmission and electron microscope, both of them will produce black and white images. Okay, so this is how the RBC is seen in the light microscope. But I'd like to go back again to what's the difference between the TEM and the SEM. TEM has a higher resolution. And it is actually being used, it's actually being used to visualize the ultra structure, the ultra structure of the ultra structure of a uh, of, an, of a cell or organisms. SEM. It's also powerful, but not as powerful as TEM. But if you want to observe a 3D image of a virus or of a cell, then we can use a transmission electron microscope. So this is how we can see RBC. Okay, so imagine RBC is 7 micrometer in diameter. This is 7 micrometer. This is 7 micrometer. And this is a staphylococcus, which is about one micrometer in diameter. And this is now the staphylococcus aureus having a binary fission. Ibig sabihin na divide na sila. And you can actually see the trans the ultra structure. You can actually see the ultra structure of the organisms. And this is now. The SEM of the Staphylococcus aureus. So you cannot see the ultrastructure, but what you are seeing here is the 3D image. Okay, so same organism, different appearance because of a different microscope. Again, this is the S aureus in SEM, S aureus in TEM. And S or use in light microscope. Okay, now we see the difference, right? So this is the S or use in light microscope, S or use in TEM or transmission electron microscope. You can see the ultra structure. And this is now the S or use in SEM where you can see or observe the 3D image. Okay. And the last microscope that we have here is the atomic force microscope. Um, this one is actually more powerful because you can now observe um, the molecules at the atomic level. Okay, uh, for this particular for this particular kind of microscope. 
Okay, so that ends our lesson on light microscopy.